All right, good morning. Once again, good to see everybody here. We're going to be in Acts chapter 3 this morning. Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1. And of course, we've already uh, gone over the establishment of the church, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, and the manifestation of the kingdom of God on earth. And we saw a great sermon by the Apostle Peter, from which came the salvation of 3,000 souls. And we saw that as Isaiah, in Isaiah 66, posed the question, can a nation be born in a day? We say, yes, it can be born in a day. 3,000 people begin this uh, holy nation, this royal priesthood, was started up in one day. As people came to faith in Jesus Christ, were baptized into his name, uh, that began the, the beginning of this experience of new creation, new life that God has already sparked forth through this pouring out of the Holy Spirit. And we saw that they didn't just believe, were baptized, and then all went home, but a community was born in which they stayed together. They were intent on listening to the apostles' teaching. They were also going from house to house, breaking bread, having communion with one another. They were engaged in prayer. And they were just in this continual state of awe at the, the wonders, the signs, the miracles that were being performed through the apostles' hands. And as we get into chapter 3, we're going to see one specific miracle that was performed through an, apostle hand, uh, an apostle's hands, that is, uh, through Peter. And we're going to see a beggar at a beautiful gate. And we're going to see a beautiful story in connection to this beautiful gate. So let's just read the story, and then we're going to kind of look at it in a, in a very general way, but uh, hopefully touch all the points in the story. Uh, this is Acts chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. And a man who had been lame from his mother's womb had been carried along, whom they used to set down every day at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, in order to beg alms of those who were entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to go into the temple, he began asking to receive alms. But Peter, along with John, fixed his gaze on him and said, Look at us. And he began to give them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have, I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, walk. And seizing him by the right hand, he raised him up, and immediately his feet and his ankles were strengthened. With a leap, he stood upright and began to walk. And he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they were taking note of him as being the one who used to sit at the beautiful gate of the temple to beg alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. All right, so in this story we find a beautiful place with a desperate need with faithful men who had an adequate answer. You wanted to just kind of summarize uh, this whole story. A beautiful place with a desperate need, with faithful men who had an adequate answer. First, it was a beautiful place. We know that because the text tells us, he says it was at the beautiful gate. But it's, we can also gather that this was a beautiful location too because of where this beautiful gate was located. It was located in the temple. The, the gate itself is believed to be the gate that goes from the court of the Gentiles that went into the court of the women. If you remember, that was also where the treasury was, where people gave alms and things like that. But um, it seems to be that gate on the eastern side of the temple, when you go from the court of the Gentiles into the, the women's court. And it's also believed that it was made of this beautiful Corinthian grass, uh, not grass, brass. <laughs> I mean, I've been so beautiful. Corinthian brass with these plates of brass, and it would have just shined in the sunlight. It's just a beautiful, beautiful gate. But it was also in a beautiful temple. The, the temple was immaculate. Uh, you know, Herod the Great made adorning the, the temple basically his pet project. And he used a lot of the funds that he received from various conquests, from the uh, Arabian Wars that he got involved in. He used a lot of those spoils and things and dedicated it to the temple and to the construction of the temple and elaborating the temple. And I brought a book on uh, Josephus, who was a historian at, in the first century, who in all likelihood was an eyewitness of this temple. And of course, we don't have, it wasn't 
pictures of the temple weren't posted on Facebook and videos on YouTube. It was destroyed in AD 70, so we don't have uh, necessarily a picture that we can see, but we do have a picture given to us by Josephus, who was an eyewitness who describes it in words. And it's located in book 15 of the Antiquity of the Jews in chapter 11. Don't worry, I'm not going to read the whole chapter to you. All I want to do is just read a small snippet of it, just to give you an idea of how beautiful this temple was. It says, Now the temple was built of stones that were white and strong, and each of their length was 25 cubits, their height was 8, and their breadth about 12. Now these cubits are lost on us, but uh, the length of it, to put it in our standard of measure, was 37 feet. One stone, 37 feet. That's humongous. And then uh, the height would have been 12 feet high. Think about a basketball goal, but two feet higher. So that big. And then the breadth of it, the width of it, would have been uh, 18 feet. Humongous stones. That's just for one stone. And they're made of this white stone, of course, that would have gleamed in the sunlight. Uh, remember in Luke 21, that was one of the things that they mentioned when uh, they were... This is kind of what sparked this whole uh, discussion or this discourse by Jesus called the Olivet Discourse. They said, you know, they're pointing out how beautiful the stones were in the temple. And Jesus says, not one stone will be left upon another. But there were these be beautiful, immaculate stones that would have gleamed in the sunlight. Very, very beautiful. Very, very awe-inspiring. Just, if nothing else, by the sheer size of them. But he goes on, he says, And the whole structure, as also the structure of the royal cluster, was on the right side, or I'm sorry, was on each side much lower, but the middle was much higher, till they were visible to those that dwelt in the country for a great many furlongs, uh, but chiefly to such as lived over against them and those that approached to them. Okay, so he's saying from many furlongs away, you can see it, a furlong was just a, an eighth of a mile. But he's, he's basically saying from a great distance, People who were living in the country, who lived opposite of this temple, the way that it was elevated in such a way, in contrast to the rest of the structure, it just, you could see it. It was just gleaming there on the mountain. You could see the beauty of the temple, even from far away. And, and that would explain why on the Mount of Olives, the disciples could have asked Jesus about the temple, and, and they would have been looking at it and pointing out to Jesus the beauty of the temple, because uh, you could see it from quite a distance. Very beautiful. Uh, it says, uh, the temple had doors also at the entrance. Now this might be describing what the beggar was actually seeing as he was uh, awaiting alms there at the beautiful gate. Uh, anyways, it goes on and says, the temple had doors also at the entrance and lentils over them. A lentil is just the, the part that goes over the door, right? Uh, and it says that they're the same height with the temple itself. So these lentils are huge uh, lentils that went over these doors. Uh, it says they were adorned with embroidered veils with their flowers of purple and pillars interwoven. And over these, but under the crown work, was spread out a golden vine with its branches hanging down from a great height, the largeness and fine workmanship of which was a surpassing sight to the spectators to see the vast materials there were and with what great skill the workmanship was done. So spectators would come and they'd just be in awe. One of the vastness of the materials, but also the great craftsmanship, the beauty, the materials that were used. It was just all inspiring. So this man at this beautiful gate, was that a beautiful temple that would have inspired people? And you can just imagine even those who weren't god fearers just coming just to see the beauty of this temple. But it was also beautiful because this was the place that represented the presence of God. This was the place where people went to meet with God. This is a place where they would go to pray to God, as we see Peter and John doing in the story here. It's a place where they offered up sacrifices. It was where the feast took place. It was where the priests ministered to God, went into the Holy of Holies. It was beautiful physically, but it was also beautiful spiritually. And of course, as those who viewed all of this together, it would have been just beautiful psychologically just to see all these wonderful things. And certainly we can think of times in which we've come across the beautiful. Maybe you went to some beautiful cathedral or you've gone to some uh, beautiful architectural structure that you went on on vacation or, or you, you even just go outside on your front porch or out in the pasture and you look up at a beautiful sunset. Uh, 
the sky just all inspiring with the beauty and the grandeur uh, that it provides. It's the beautiful that gets us into connection with the transcendent. Now, what's important to understand here is that even though this beggar was in this beautiful place, he's still lame and he still can't walk. He's still having to be carried where he goes. Beauty in and of itself cannot provide salvation or deliverance or healing, but it can at least point us to the transcendent who can, to God himself. And so that's why when we see a beautiful painting or we see a beautiful mural or we're in a beautiful building or we're before a beautiful sunset or we're on top of a beautiful mountain, it draws us into something bigger than ourselves. It draws us into something more beautiful than life itself. And it's the open door, excuse the pun, but it's the open door, the open gate to the transcendent that ought to lead us to then seek out the one who can heal, the one who can provide us with the answers that we need. But this man was at a beautiful place. But as mentioned, it was also a desperate need. Notice the contrast here. Beautiful gate in the midst of a beautiful and immaculate temple on top of a beautiful mountain that could be seen for miles and miles around. Yet here's this man who was desperate, helpless, and impotent, unable to do anything of his own strength. Born lame. And it seems to be from the language of the text that he was born with some type of deformity in his ankles and in his feet, which caused him to not be able to walk. Not only from the time that he was born, but probably even when he was in his mother's womb, this was the case. And so this would have caused great uh, negative effects into his life. Um, for one, he wouldn't have been able to work and to provi provide for himself. Right? That's probably the most obvious thing. But also, he wouldn't, he wouldn't be able to really raise a family because he wouldn't have the means to support such a family. Uh, he was probably an outcast of society. Remember in John chapter 9, the man who was born blind, what did they assume about him? They said, well, did this man sin or did his parents sin that he was born blind? Here's a man who's lame from the time of birth. And we can only imagine that the same thing was spoken about him. There must be some type of sin either in this individual's life or a sin in the family's life. Uh, and, and by the way, I think we mentioned this uh, when we are talking about John chapter 9. If, if a baby was in a mother's womb, when she worshipped an idol, it was seen as a baby, him or herself, also being involved in that sin. That's why you could say, did this man sin or did his parents, or both, we, they might say. Anyway, they might try to say the same thing about this lame man as well. It must be some type of sin in his life. So from a social standpoint and a spiritual standpoint, he would have been looked down upon. Because he was lame, he couldn't really uh, have full access to the temple, most likely. And so this man was in a desperate state, unable to help himself just to get to the temple to ask for alms. He had to have people carry him. He was completely helpless without any um, chance of helping himself. The doctors, no matter what doctor he saw, they would not have been able to help him. No matter how much he wished it, no matter how much he tried to visualize it, he couldn't bring the healing on himself. He was helpless. There was no one who could help him. And, of course, we find that to be true with us. You know the world is full of lame people? <laughs> I don't mean that in a derogatory sense. But all of us were lame at one point in our lives. And we come into contact with lame people all the time. What do I mean by that? All I mean is that we all had the same situation. From our mother's birth, we too were helpless. Uh, we'll look in a moment at, in Romans chapter 5 where it talks about while we were still helpless... Uh, fill in the blank. We were, all of us at some point in our lives, were unable to walk a perfect walk before God. We, we tripped up, we stumbled, we fell. To stay in line with Romans 3.23, we all fell short of the glory of God. We've all fallen short of the glory or the standard that God has provided for us. And try as we may, try, as much as we try perhaps to walk a perfect life, to keep in step with God 100% of the time, we just couldn't do it. We would fall time and time again. There's just something within us that would not allow us to do that. As we've talked about before, you know, there's two laws within us. We have the law of survival in the flesh, but then we have the law of morality in the spirit. 
And these two things are always in contrast with one another. There's always friction between the two. And so time and time again, what would we do? We go into survival mode, protect self, care for self, be focused on self, when all the while the moral side of us was saying, sacrifice self, give self up. And so we have all stumbled. We've all become lame in that sense. Unable to really work our way up to God. Unable to climb those steps up into heaven. Unable to do anything to procure a position before God. We were all like the lame man. And we can say also, continuing on, that we come into contact with people day in and day out who are spiritually lame. Uh, again, I don't mean that in a derogatory way or in a condescending way because we were all like that before we came to Christ. We come across people who, like us, they can't do anything to perfectly keep God's law, to perfectly walk before Him. Um, it's just a, it's a part of human nature. It's a part of the human condition. We all stumble. We all say the wrong thing at the wrong time. We all do the wrong things, oftentimes at the wrong time. Um, we don't give God the reverence that is due to his name all the time. We all just stumble and we fall short. And we come across those who are in the situation that we were in too before coming to Christ. It's important to know that we, like Peter and John, are coming across people day in and day out who have a desperate need. Who have a desperate need that they cannot solve for themselves. Other people cannot solve for them. Only one person can solve. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. So this was a beautiful place, but in this beautiful place, there was a desperate need. A man who was impotent, a man who was unable to walk, unable to care for himself, and especially unable to heal himself. But also in this location, in this beautiful place where there was also this desperate need, which really began to change the situation, was there were some faithful men. Some faithful men who came across this man. They were faithful in the sense that they were dedicated to prayer. Here it says that it was in the ninth hour, which was, uh, would have been 3 o'clock, nine hours from sunrise, which would have been uh, 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And in the Jewish uh, practice and tradition, they had three hours of prayer. They had one at uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, one at sunset. And so that they had basically three times of prayer throughout the day. And this would have been that middle one at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And these guys were dedicated to prayer and going to the temple to pray. Um, that was one of the main things that they were focused on. And so this put them kind of in a position to help this guy. If Peter and John would have been more concerned about other things, if they'd been thinking about other things, had they not been really dedicated to the hour of prayer, going and praying to the Lord, they probably never would have contacted this guy. And if they did contact him, who knows if they even would have been able to, they would have either thought about healing him or even had the power to do so. If you remember in Matthew chapter 17, when, when they went to the Mount of Transfiguration and they came down, Jesus and Peter, James and John, they came down and there's this argument going on and this man had a son who had a demon. And there's this argument in the, in the crowd and a lot of commotion because Jesus' disciples weren't able to cast out the demon. And what did Jesus tell them? He said, this kind can only come out through what? Prayer and fasting. Not that as soon as they came across him, all of a sudden we got to start praying and fasting, but a life of prayer and fasting, of devotion to God. That's what facilitates the power to cast out the demon. And we could perhaps even connect that to this story where because Peter and John were, were dedicated men, men dedicated to prayer, it put them in a position spiritually to perform this miracle. Oftentimes when we think about the apostles, we only think about preaching. And we only think about teaching. Because that's what we have you know, recorded for us. Their teachings, the doctrines handed down to us through the apostles and prophets. But another big aspect of the apostles was prayer. If you go to Acts chapter 6, when you have that situation where the Hellenistic Jews were being overlooked in the serving of the tables... And there's this big kind of conflict that's beginning to erupt in the church. The apostles tell them, you know what, you go out and select some men to take care of this. Um, this isn't something that we need to be distracted by. He says in verse 2, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. But we will devote ourselves to what? To prayer 
and to the ministry of the word. So here the apostles are saying, we don't want to be distracted, not just so that we can go into our office and just study a bunch of books, or you know, just so that we can just teach, but also so that we can pray. Prayer complements every work that we do. It's not just for the apostles. Anyone who's doing the work and the labor of the kingdom, it always should be coupled with prayer. And prayer is that which anoints what you're doing. It's prayer that puts you into contact with God. It's prayer that opens you up to the power of God to even do the work itself. If you're just trying to do it in your own strength and in the strength of the flesh, we will always fail. But we do it in prayer. Prayerfully sharing the gospel. Prayerfully serving the sick. Prayerfully ministering to the church. Prayer always has to be that added component uh, that brings uh, power to whatever ministry, whatever service you might be carrying out. So there were people who were praying, but there were also these faithful men were people who didn't mind being distracted, didn't mind getting away from their schedule. Um, You know, Typically, when we're out about doing things, we don't notice the lame person over here or the person who's, who needs a, a word from Jesus, who needs to hear the gospel. We don't oftentimes notice the person who needs to hear the word of the message of the salvation that Christ can provide. And we just kind of go about our business. We go to the grocery store. We go to work. And oftentimes, we're just focused on what, what we got to get done. Okay, I'm going to the grocery store. I'm going to Walmart because I got to get this, 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 and this. Or we're at work and we're just focused on these are the tasks I have to accomplish here at work. These are the things I have to do. Maybe we're just trying to get through the day unscathed uh, at work or at home, wherever we're at. And we're really just trying to get through the day. But Peter and John were the type of people who could be distracted from that. Who, when a person asked them or something, they didn't say, get out of here. You know, we're on a, we're on a tight schedule here. It's almost three o'clock. We got to go pray. Uh, that's, that's why we're here. We're not here to give alms. We're here to... Uh, direct our hearts to God in prayer. They didn't even have money on them, so that was clearly wasn't their intent when they were going to the temple to give alms. It was just to go and pray. And they didn't push him away and say, no, that's not a part of our agenda. That's not on our schedule. But they were willing to be distracted by that. And I wonder, you know, are we willing to do that as well? Do we have a heart for people so much that we don't mind if it takes us a little bit longer to make that trip to the grocery store? Or, or we don't mind engaging in maybe a difficult or an awkward conversation with a coworker uh, after work or something like that. Um, are we willing to get off of our agenda, to get distracted, to get kind of off track a little bit from our to-do list, our schedules, and our agenda to actually go out and reach people who are in need? And that applies not just to sharing the gospel, any need that people have that are around us. Um, oftentimes we want to get tunnel vision and forget about what's going on around us. Peter and John were the type of people who, in verse 4, fixed their gaze, or Peter fixed his gaze on him. Do we fix our gaze on people? Do we fix our gaze on the needs around us? Uh, So that made a difference in this story. But also we could see that these were people who were bold when they did finally have conversation with this guy. Um, You know, he's, he's looking at them, expecting some type of alms, And Peter looks down at him and says, you know, silver and gold we don't have, but what we do have, we will give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up. He didn't say, well, you know, if maybe kind of, sort of, if you believe in Jesus, you might be able to get healed. Or, you know, you have a lot of options before you. There's a lot of Greek gods that maybe you could try to pray for them, but then maybe eventually try to get around to praying to Jesus. They weren't, they didn't water it down. It didn't try to back down from proclaiming the name of Jesus. He just said, in the name of Jesus, get up and walk. They were bold. I'm pretty sure this came out of their dedication to prayer and staying connected to God and, and the spiritual disciplines and things like that. But they had a boldness about them. Peter had a boldness about him. And he used that to bring healing to this man. So these faithful men are a good example for us. You know, we live in a very beautiful world. We even have a lot of beautiful things that mankind has made that people can view and see. But, but what we need to not forget is that there's also a desperate need in this world as well, that, that beauty in and of itself can't cure. We have to be people who are dedicated to prayer, ourselves stay in contact with God. But at the same time, we need to be people with our eyes open, willing to be distracted, willing to get off of our agenda, 
but also people who are bold in proclaiming the name of Jesus. If so, we can make a difference in people's lives. Imagine if Peter and John didn't do this. This man would have lived the rest of his life lame, having to be carried, probably hungry, sunburnt, all those things. But because they were willing to do these things, it changed their life. And you and I can change your life too when we will follow the example of Peter and John in this story. Whether it's meeting physical needs or spiritual needs, we can make a difference. If we just focus a little less on ourselves and focus more on others, and if we'll just be bold in, in doing the things that Christ has called us to do and in proclaiming his name. And so we have a beautiful place with a desperate need, with faithful men, but the last part of the equation is what really makes the difference, the adequate answer. None of the other parts would have mattered without the adequate answer, without Jesus Christ, without the name of Jesus Christ, the authority of Jesus Christ. And here we have Peter saying that. It says uh, there in verse 6, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene walk. It was only in that name that it would take place. In verse 16, that we'll probably cover next week, uh, as Paul's responding to the response of the people, it says, On the basis of faith in his name, it is in the name of Jesus, which, was strengthened, which has strengthened this man, whom you see and know, and the faith which comes through him has given this perfect health in the presence of you all. It was the name of Jesus that was the only answer that this man could, ha could receive in which he could find healing, and then we can as safely assume salvation, as he would have came to faith in Jesus Christ, having experienced this uh, healing. It was only in the name of Jesus. Later on in the book of Acts, we'll, we'll read where, where Peter says, there's no other, no other name by which men can be saved. Peter and John, till they were blue in the face, till, they, till they, their voices wore out, they could have said, in the name of Zeus, in the name of Epaphrodite, or in the name of Baal, or in the name of Malak, uh, get up, and the man would have stayed right where he was seated. And they could have done that to their blue in face. Remember with uh, Elijah and the priests of Baal? They're gashing themselves, and they're just crying out to him because uh, he challenged them to have, uh, to have this fire come down on their altar, and they were just doing this, and, and uh, Elijah's saying, well, where is your God? Uh, maybe he's excused himself. Uh, maybe he's asleep. What happened to your God? And they're just crying out to him and nothing happens. Elijah completely soaks his altar with the sacrifice on it and all he does is have to pray once and fire comes down out of heaven and consumes the whole thing. Water, altar, sacrifice, all. It was a name that made the difference. It was only the name of Jesus that could bring healing to this person, to this individual. It was Jesus who was the adequate answer to this man's problem. And as we look around the world, as a, well, first let's reflect on ourselves, you know. In the situation that we were in, as we were spiritually lame, there was only one person who could heal us of that. It was Jesus Christ. We were all laid at a beautiful gate, just like the, the lame man. That beautiful gate was Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the door. No one comes to the Father except through me. And there's no more beautiful gate and all the world that's ever existed in history more beautiful than Jesus. But we're all at the gate. And it wasn't until we actually came into contact with Jesus, in the name of Jesus, that we were able to enter in. We know that after he's healed, it tells us later, uh, there in verse 8, With a leap he stood aright, aright and began to walk, and he entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. He was able to enter into the gate through this healing that took place. And as we come upon the authority, the name of Jesus, we too can find the answer that can bring us into the presence, presence of God by a new and living way, the Hebrew writer would call it. Uh, but it's only through Jesus. Now, real point, a point of clarification real quick, and, and this can sometimes be misunderstood because sometimes people might think, well, the name of Jesus is like some incantation, right? Uh, we'll just say the name of Jesus and then a healing will take place. As though just saying that name is what brings power and, and things. But we've got to remember, later on in the book of Acts, there's going to be some non-believers who try to proclaim the name of Jesus on some demons. People who are possessed by demons, and what did they do? They fled out naked. The demons were like, Paul we know, and Jesus we know, but who are you? And they had to run out. It's not just you know saying the name of Jesus, 
with the power and the authority of Jesus' name being proclaimed by faithful men and women uh, who are living lives before him. That makes a difference. It's the contact of, yes, the authority and the power of Christ with faith that brings the power. And we know that in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. The gospel is the great power that can bring salvation. We see this story and we think, wow, that's amazing to see a person who's crippled, who probably his ankles were twisted and disjointed and things, and now all of a sudden he's running and leaping. That's a wonderful miracle. But I say the greatest miracle that happened in this individual's life was finding contact in Jesus Christ and finding faith in him and salvation in his name. That's where the true power of God, or the, I'd say the greatest manifestation of the power of God, is demonstrated in a person's life. And so as we reflect on this story, we think about a beautiful place with a desperate need, with faithful men who give an adequate answer. And the question is, as we go out into this beautiful world, we go into this beautiful world that God has created, with the beautiful trees and the grass and the sunrise, and even all the beautiful things that God has given mankind the ability to build and construct and to create, if you go out into this world, let's not be distracted so much by the beauty that we can't see the need. And go out into the world and be those faithful men and women who will be dedicated to cultivating their own spiritual health and staying close to God in, in prayer and connection to God in prayer and worship and study of the word so that we can be in a position to then be able to see the needs out there, fix our gaze on those who are in a situation where they need help and go to those situations, go to those people Boldly proclaiming the name of Jesus, boldly proclaiming the gospel message that salvation is through him and that there's no other name through which man can be saved or by which mankind can be saved. And bring them in so that they can be healed, that they can go into the temple and then what? That they can walk. That they can walk so that they can walk in a way that is pleasing to God and have a healthy spiritual walk in which they're pleasing the Lord, they're serving others, and they're glorifying God all the time. So these are some thoughts, some ideas from uh, this story of the, of the beggar at the beautiful gate. I thought we'll close our message this morning. I didn't want to get so much into the next section. It's a pretty large section. We get into actually Peter's response to the response of the people. And uh, Lord willing, in two weeks, we'll, we'll dig into that. But uh, I think we have enough to kind of think about now. As we go into this upcoming week, are we going to... Put into practice the things that Peter and John give us a great example for. Are we going to go out and boldly proclaim the name of Jesus and help people come to find healing, but also to find, uh, find the means by which they can come into the presence of God in a relationship with Him? And if you're here this morning and you realize, you know what, maybe I'm the lame beggar. Maybe I'm the person who have tried to, I've tried to do what's right. I've tried to walk straight. I've tried to... Uh, do a, live a life that was pleasing to God and do things perfectly, but I realize I'm, I stumble, I mess up, I fall down, I don't get it right, sometimes I get off on the wrong track. Just know, just like this man, you can find healing in Jesus Christ. Through Jesus Christ, you can be healed to where you can then walk before the Lord, uh, before Him, and you can also find access to Him through the name of Jesus Christ. As you place your faith in Him, as you confess Him, as you're baptized into Him, you can begin a, a, a walk before God and live this uh, type of life before Him. So if you'd like to do that this morning, we'd encourage you to come forward as we stand and sing the song that JT has prepared.